Welcome to Catholic Culture Audiobooks, the only podcast bringing to life classic Catholic works through professional, high-quality audiobook recordings. Stay up to date with our latest podcast releases by signing up for our newsletter at catholicculture.org slash get audio. Today's reading, Knowledge Viewed in Relation to Religion, from the Idea of a University, by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski. We shall be brought, gentlemen, today to the termination of the investigation which I commenced three discourses back, and which, I was well aware from its length, if for no other reason, would make demands upon the patience even of indulgent hearers. First, I employed myself in establishing the principle that knowledge is its own reward, and I showed that, when considered in this light, it is called liberal knowledge and is the scope of academical institutions. Next, I examined what is meant by knowledge when it is said to be pursued for its own sake, and I showed that, in order satisfactorily to fulfill this idea, philosophy must be its form, or, in other words, that its matter must not be admitted into the mind passively as so much acquirement, but must be mastered and appropriated as a system consisting of parts, related one to the other and interpretive of one another in the unity of a whole. Further, I showed that such a philosophical contemplation of the field of knowledge as a whole, leading as it did to an understanding of its separate departments and an appreciation of them respectively, might in consequence be rightly called an illumination. Also, it was rightly called an enlargement of mind, because it was a distinct location of things one with another, as if in space while it was, moreover, its proper cultivation and its best condition, both because it secured to the intellect the sight of things as they are, or of truth in opposition to fancy, opinion, and theory, and again because it presupposed and involved the perfection of its various powers. Such, I said, was that knowledge which deserves to be sought for its own sake, even though it promised no ulterior advantage. But, when I had got as far as this, I went farther and observed that, from the nature of the case, what was so good in itself could not but have a number of external uses, though it did not promise them, simply because it was good, and that it was necessarily the source of benefits to society, great and diversified in proportion to its own intrinsic excellence. Just as in morals, honesty is the best policy, as being profitable in a secular aspect, though such profit is not the measure of its worth, so too as regards what may be called the virtues of the intellect, their very possession indeed is a substantial good and is enough, yet still that substance has a shadow inseparable from it, namely its social and political usefulness. And this was the subject to which I devoted the preceding discourse. One portion of the subject remains. This intellectual culture, which is so exalted in itself, not only has a bearing upon social and active duties, but upon religion also. The educated mind may be said to be, in a certain sense, religious. That is, it has what may be considered a religion of its own, independent of Catholicism, partly cooperating with it, partly thwarting it. At once a defense, yet a disturbance to the Church in Catholic countries, and in countries beyond her pale, at one time in open warfare with her, at another in defensive alliance. The history of schools and academies, and of literature and science generally, will, I think, justify me in thus speaking. Since, then, my aim in these discourses is to ascertain the function and the action of a university viewed in itself, and its relations to the various instruments of teaching and training which are round about it, my survey of it would not be complete unless I attempted, as I now propose to do, to exhibit its general bearings upon religion. Right reason, that is, reason rightly exercised, leads the mind to the Catholic faith, and plants it there, and teaches it in all its religious speculations to act under its guidance. But reason, considered as a real agent in the world, and as an operative principle in man's nature, with an historical course and with definite results, is far from taking so straight and satisfactory a direction. It considers itself from first to last independent and supreme. It requires no external authority. It makes a religion for itself. Even though it accepts Catholicism, it does not go to sleep. 
It has an action and development of its own, as the passions have, or the moral sentiments, or the principle of self-interest. Divine grace, to use the language of theology, does not by its presence supersede nature, nor is nature at once brought into simple concurrence and coalition with grace. Nature pursues its course, now coincident with that of grace, now parallel to it, now across, now divergent, now counter, in proportion to its own imperfection and to the attraction and influence which grace exerts over it. And what takes place as regards other principles of our nature and their developments is found also as regards the reason. There is, we know, a religion of enthusiasm, of superstitious ignorance, of statecraft, and each has that in it which resembles Catholicism, and that again which contradicts Catholicism. There is the religion of a warlike people and of a pastoral people. There is a religion of rude times, and in like manner there is a religion of civilized times, of the cultivated intellect, of the philosopher, scholar, and gentleman. This is that religion of reason of which I speak. Viewed in itself, however near it comes to Catholicism, it is, of course, simply distinct from it. For Catholicism is one whole and admits of no compromise or modification. Yet this is to view it in the abstract. In matter of fact, and in reference to individuals, we can have no difficulty in conceiving this philosophical religion present in a Catholic country as a spirit influencing men to a certain extent, for good or for bad or for both. A spirit of the age, which again may be found as among Catholics, so with still greater sway and success in a country not Catholic, yet specifically the same in such a country as it exists in a Catholic community. The problem then before us today is to set down some portions of the outline, if we can ascertain them, of the religion of civilization, and to determine how they lie relatively to those principles, doctrines, and rules which heaven has given us in the Catholic Church. And here again, when I speak of revealed truth, it is scarcely necessary to say that I am not referring to the main articles and prominent points of faith as contained in the Creed. Had I undertaken to delineate a philosophy which directly interfered with the Creed, I could not have spoken of it as compatible with the profession of Catholicism. The philosophy I speak of, whether it be viewed within or outside the Church, does not necessarily take cognizance of the Creed. Where the country is Catholic, the educated mind takes its articles for granted by a sort of implicit faith. Where it is not, it simply ignores them and the whole subject matter to which they relate as not affecting social and political interests. Truths about God's nature, about his dealings towards the human race, about the economy of redemption, in the one case it humbly accepts them and passes on, in the other it passes them over as matters of simple opinion which never can be decided and which can have no power over us to make us morally better or worse. I am not speaking, then, of belief in the great objects of faith when I speak of Catholicism, but I am contemplating Catholicism chiefly as a system of pastoral instruction and moral duty, and I have to do with its doctrines mainly as they are subservient to its direction of the conscience and the conduct. I speak of it, for instance, as teaching the ruined state of man, his utter inability to gain heaven by anything he can do himself, the moral certainty of his losing his soul if left to himself, the simple absence of all rights and claims on the part of the creature in the presence of the Creator, the illimitable claims of the Creator on the service of the creature, the imperative and obligatory force of the voice of conscience and the inconceivable evil of sensuality. I speak of it as teaching that no one gains heaven except by the free grace of God or without a regeneration of nature, that no one can please him without faith, that the heart is the seat both of sin and of obedience, that charity is the fulfilling of the law, and that incorporation into the Catholic Church is the ordinary instrument of salvation. These are the lessons which distinguish Catholicism as a popular religion, and these are the subjects to which the cultivated intellect will practically be turned. I have to compare and contrast not the doctrinal, but the moral and social teaching of philosophy on the one hand, and Catholicism on the other. Now, on opening the subject, we see at once a momentous benefit which the philosopher is likely to confer on the pastors of the church. It is obvious 
that the first step which they have to effect in the conversion of man and the renovation of his nature is his rescue from that fearful subjection to sense which is his ordinary state. To be able to break through the meshes of that thraldom and to disentangle and to disengage its ten thousand holds upon the heart is to bring it, I might almost say, halfway to heaven. Here, even divine grace, to speak of things according to their appearances, is ordinarily baffled and retires without expedient or resource before this giant fascination. Religion seems too high and unearthly to be able to exert a continued influence upon us. Its effort to rouse the soul and the soul's effort to cooperate are too violent to last. It is like holding out the arm at full length, or supporting some great weight, which we manage to do for a time, but soon are exhausted and succumb. Nothing can act beyond its own nature. When, then, we are called to what is supernatural, though those extraordinary aids from heaven are given us with which obedience becomes possible, yet even with them it is of transcendent difficulty. We are drawn down to earth every moment with the ease and certainty of a natural gravitation, and it is only by sudden impulses and, as it were, forcible plunges that we attempt to mount upwards. Religion indeed enlightens, terrifies, subdues. It gives faith. It inflicts remorse. It inspires resolutions. It draws tears. It inflames devotion. But only for the occasion— I repeat, it imparts an inward power which ought to affect more than this. I am not forgetting either the real sufficiency of its aids nor the responsibility of those in whom they fail. I am not discussing theological questions at all. I am looking at phenomena as they lie before me, and I say that, in matter of fact, the sinful spirit repents and protests it will never sin again, and for a while is protected by disgust and abhorrence from the malice of its foe. But that foe knows too well that such seasons of repentance are wont to have their end. He patiently waits till nature faints with the effort of resistance and lies passive and hopeless under the next access of temptation. What we need, then, is some expedient or instrument which at least will obstruct and stave off the approach of our spiritual enemy, and which is sufficiently congenial and level with our nature to maintain as firm a hold upon us as the inducements of sensual gratification. It will be our wisdom to employ nature against itself. Thus sorrow, sickness, and care are providential antagonists to our inward disorders, They come upon us as years pass on and generally produce their natural effects on us in proportion as we are subjected to their influence. These, however, are God's instruments, not ours. We need a similar remedy, which we can make our own, the object of some legitimate faculty or the aim of some natural affection which is capable of resting on the mind and taking up its familiar lodging with it and engrossing it, and which thus becomes a match for the besetting power of sensuality and a sort of homeopathic medicine for the disease. Here, then, I think, is the important aid which intellectual cultivation furnishes to us in rescuing the victims of passion and self-will. It does not supply religious motives. It is not the cause or proper antecedent of anything supernatural. It is not meritorious of heavenly aid or reward. But it does a work at least materially good, as theologians speak, whatever be its real and formal character. It expels the excitements of sense by the introduction of those of the intellect. This, then, is the prima facie advantage of the pursuit of knowledge. It is the drawing the mind off from things which will harm it to subjects which are worthy of a rational being. And though it does not raise it above nature, nor has any tendency to make us pleasing to our Maker, yet is it nothing to substitute what is in itself harmless for what is, to say the least, inexpressibly dangerous? Is it a little thing to exchange a circle of ideas which are certainly sinful for others which are certainly not so? You will say, perhaps, in the words of the Apostle, knowledge puffeth up, 
And doubtless this mental cultivation, even when it is successful for the purpose for which I am applying it, may be from the first nothing more than the substitution of pride for sensuality. I grant it. I think I shall have something to say on this point presently. But this is not a necessary result. It is but an incidental evil, a danger which may be realized or may be averted, whereas we may in most cases predicate guilt and guilt of a heinous kind, where the mind is suffered to run wild and indulge its thoughts without training or law of any kind. And surely to turn away a soul from mortal sin is a good and a gain so far, whatever comes of it. And therefore, if a friend in need is twice a friend, I conceive that intellectual employments, though they do no more than occupy the mind with objects naturally noble or innocent, have a special claim upon our consideration and gratitude. Nor is this all. Knowledge, the discipline by which it is gained, and the tastes which it forms, have a natural tendency to refine the mind, and to give it an indisposition, simply natural, yet real, nay, more than this, a disgust and abhorrence towards excesses and enormities of evil, which are often or ordinarily reached at length by those who are not careful from the first to set themselves against what is vicious and criminal. It generates within the mind a fastidiousness, analogous to the delicacy or daintiness which good nature or a sickly habit induces in respect of food. And this fastidiousness, though arguing no high principle, though no protection in the case of violent temptation, nor sure in its operation, yet will often or generally be lively enough to create an absolute loathing of certain offenses, or a detestation and scorn of them as ungentlemanlike, to which ruder natures, nay, such as have far more of real religion in them, are tempted or even betrayed. Scarcely can we exaggerate the value in its place of a safeguard such as this, as regards those multitudes who are thrown upon the open field of the world or are withdrawn from its eye and from the restraint of public opinion. In many cases, where it exists, sins familiar to those who are otherwise circumstanced will not even occur to the mind. In others, the sense of shame and the quickened apprehension of detection will act as a sufficient obstacle to them when they do present themselves before it. Then, again, the fastidiousness I am speaking of will create a simple hatred of that miserable tone of conversation which, obtaining as it does in the world, is a constant fuel of evil, heaped up round about the soul. Moreover, it will create an irresolution and indecision in doing wrong, which will act as a remora till the danger is passed away. And though it has no tendency, I repeat, to mend the heart, or to secure it from the dominion in other shapes of those very evils which it repels in the particular modes of approach by which they prevail over others, yet cases may occur when it gives birth, after sins have been committed, to so keen a remorse and so intense a self-hatred as are even sufficient to cure the particular moral disorder and prevent its accesses ever afterwards, as the spendthrift in the story who, after gazing on his lost acres from the summit of an eminence, came down a miser, and remained a miser to the end of his days. And all this holds good in a special way in an age such as ours, when, although pain of body and mind may be rife as heretofore, yet other counteractions of evil, of a penal character, which are present at other times, are away. In rude and semi-barbarous periods, at least in a climate such as our own, it is the daily, nay, the principal business of the senses to convey feelings of discomfort to the mind as far as they convey feelings at all. Exposure to the elements, social disorder and lawlessness, the tyranny of the powerful and the inroads of enemies are a stern discipline allowing brief intervals or awarding a sharp penance to sloth and sensuality. The rude food, the scanty clothing, the violent exercise, the vagrant life— the military constraint, the imperfect pharmacy, which now are the trials of only particular classes of the community, were once the lot more or less of all. In the deep woods, or the wild solitudes of the medieval era, feelings of religion or superstition were naturally present to the population, which in various ways cooperated with the missionary or pastor in retaining it in a noble simplicity of manners. But, when in the advancement of society men congregate in towns, and multiply in contracted spaces, and law gives them security, and art gives them comforts, and good government robs them of courage and manliness, and monotony of life throws them back upon themselves, who does not see 
that diversion or protection from evil they have none, that vice is the mere reaction of unhealthy toil, and sensual excess the holiday of resourceless ignorance. This is so well understood by the practical benevolence of the day that it has especially busied itself in plans for supplying the masses of our town population with intellectual and honorable recreations, cheap literature, libraries of useful and entertaining knowledge, scientific lectureships, museums, zoological collections, buildings and gardens to please the eye and to give repose to the feelings, external objects of whatever kind, which may take the mind off itself and expand and elevate it in liberal contemplations. These are the human means, wisely suggested and good as far as they go, for at least parrying the assaults of moral evil, and keeping at bay the enemies not only of the individual soul, but of society at large. Such are the instruments by which an age of advanced civilization combats those moral disorders which reason as well as revelation denounces. And I have not been backward to express my sense of their servableness to religion. Moreover, they are but the foremost of a series of influences which intellectual culture exerts upon our moral nature, and all upon the type of Christianity, manifesting themselves in veracity, probity, equity, fairness, gentleness, benevolence, and amiableness. So much so that a character more noble to look at, more beautiful, more winning in the various relations of life and in personal duties is hardly conceivable than may or might be its result when that culture is bestowed upon a soil naturally adapted to virtue. If you would obtain a picture for contemplation which may seem to fulfill the ideal which the Apostle has delineated under the name of charity, in its sweetness and harmony, its generosity, its courtesy to others, and its depreciation of self, you could not have recourse to a better furnished studio than to that of philosophy, with the specimens of it which with greater or lesser exactness are scattered through society in a civilized age. It is enough to refer you, gentlemen, to the various biographies and remains of contemporaries and others which from time to time issue from the press to see how striking is the action of our intellectual upon our moral nature, where the moral material is rich and the intellectual cast is perfect. Individuals will occur to all of us who deservedly attract our love and admiration and whom the world almost worships as the work of its own hands. Religious principle, indeed, that is, faith, is to all appearance simply a way. The work is as certainly not supernatural as it is certainly noble and beautiful. This must be insisted on, that the intellect may have its due. But it also must be insisted on, for the sake of conclusions to which I wish to conduct our investigation. The radical difference, indeed, of this mental refinement from genuine religion, in spite of its seeming relationship, is the very cardinal point on which my present discussion turns. Yet, on the other hand, such refinement may readily be assigned to a Christian origin by hasty or distant observers, or by those who view it in a particular light. And as this is the case, I think it advisable, before proceeding with the delineation of its characteristic features, to point out to you distinctly the elementary principles on which its morality is based. You will bear in mind, then, gentlemen, that I spoke just now of the scorn and hatred which a cultivated mind feels for some kinds of vice, and the utter disgust and profound humiliation which may come over it if it should happen in any degree to be betrayed into them. Now this feeling may have its root in faith and love, but it may not. There is nothing really religious in it, considered by itself. Conscience, indeed, is implanted in the breast by nature, but it inflicts upon us fear as well as shame. When the mind is simply angry with itself and nothing more, surely the true import of the voice of nature and the depth of its intimations have been forgotten, and a false philosophy has misinterpreted emotions which ought to lead to God. Fear implies the transgression of a law, and a law implies a lawgiver and judge but the tendency of intellectual culture is to swallow up the fear in the self-reproach, and self-reproach is directed and limited to our mere sense of what is fitting and becoming. Fear carries us out of ourselves, whereas shame may act upon us only within the round of our own thoughts. Such, I say, is the danger which awaits a civilized age, 
Such is its besetting sin, not inevitable, God forbid, or we must abandon the use of God's own gifts, but still the ordinary sin of the intellect. Conscience tends to become what is called a moral sense. The command of duty is a sort of taste. Sin is not an offense against God, but against human nature. The less amiable specimens of this spurious religion are those which we meet not unfrequently in my own country. I can use with all my heart the poet's words, England, with all thy faults, I love thee still. But to those faults no Catholic can be blind. We find these men possessed of many virtues, but proud, bashful, fastidious, and reserved. Why is this? It is because they think and act as if there were really nothing objective in their religion. It is because conscience to them is not the word of a lawgiver, as it ought to be, but the dictate of their own minds and nothing more. It is because they do not look out of themselves, because they do not look through and beyond their own minds to their Maker, but are engrossed in notions of what is due to themselves, to their own dignity and their own consistency. Their conscience has become a mere self-respect. Instead of doing one thing and then another as each is called for in faith and obedience, careless of what may be called the keeping of deed with deed, and leaving him who gives the command to blend the portions of their conduct into a whole, their one object, however unconscious to themselves, is to paint a smooth and perfect surface, and to be able to say to themselves that they have done their duty. When they do wrong, they feel not contrition, of which God is the object, but remorse and a sense of degradation. They call themselves fools, not sinners. They are angry and impatient, not humble. They shut themselves up in themselves. It is misery to them to think or to speak of their own feelings. It is misery to suppose that others see them, and their shyness and sensitiveness often become morbid. As to confession, which is so natural to the Catholic, to them it is impossible, unless, indeed, in cases where they have been guilty, an apology is due to their own character, is expected of them, and will be satisfactory to look back upon. They are victims of an intense self-contemplation. There are, however, far more pleasing and interesting forms of this moral malady than that which I have been depicting. I have spoken of the effect of intellectual culture on proud natures, but it will show to greater advantage, yet with as little approximation to religious faith, in amiable and unaffected minds. Observe, gentlemen, the heresy, as it may be called, of which I speak, is the substitution of a moral sense or taste for conscience in the true meaning of the word. Now this error may be the foundation of a character of far more elasticity and grace than ever adorned the persons whom I have been describing. It is especially congenial to men of an imaginative and poetical cast of mind, who will readily accept the notion that virtue is nothing more than the graceful in conduct. Such persons, far from tolerating fear as a principle in their apprehension of religious and moral truth, will not be slow to call it simply gloom and superstition. Rather, a philosopher's, a gentleman's religion, is of a liberal and generous character. It is based upon honor. Vice is evil because it is unworthy, despicable, and odious. This was the quarrel of the ancient heathen with Christianity, that instead of simply fixing the mind on the fair and the pleasant, it intermingled other ideas with them of a sad and painful nature, that it spoke of tears before joy, a cross before a crown, that it laid the foundation of heroism in penance, that it made the soul tremble with the news of purgatory and hell, that it insisted on views and a worship of the deity which to their minds was nothing else than mean, servile, and cowardly. The notion of an all-perfect, ever-present God in whose sight we are less than atoms, and who, while he deigns to visit us, can punish as well as bless, was abhorrent to them. They made their own minds their sanctuary, their own ideas their oracle, and conscience in morals was but parallel to genius in art and wisdom in philosophy. 
Had I room for all that might be said upon the subject, I might illustrate this intellectual religion from the history of the Emperor Julian, the apostate from Christian truth, the foe of Christian education. He, in whom every Catholic sees the shadow of the future Antichrist, was all but the pattern man of philosophical virtue. Weak points in his character he had, it is true, even in a merely poetical standard. But take him all in all, and I cannot but recognize in him a specious beauty and nobleness of moral deportment, which combines in it the rude greatness of Fabricius or Regulus with the accomplishments of Pliny or Antoninus. His simplicity of manners, his frugality, his austerity of life, his singular disdain of sensual pleasure, his military heroism, his application to business, his literary diligence, his modesty, his clemency, his accomplishments, as I view them, go to make him one of the most eminent specimens of pagan virtue which the world has ever seen. Yet how shallow, how meager, nay, how unamiable is that virtue after all when brought upon its critical trial by his sudden summons into the presence of his judge. His last hours form a unique passage in history, both as illustrating the helplessness of philosophy under the stern realities of our being, and as being reported to us on the evidence of an eyewitness. Friends and fellow soldiers, he said, to use the words of a writer, well fitted both from his literary tastes and from his hatred of Christianity to be his panegyrist. The seasonable period of my departure is now arrived, and I discharge, with the cheerfulness of a ready debtor, the demands of nature. I die without remorse, as I have lived without guilt. I am pleased to reflect on the innocence of my private life, and I can affirm with confidence that the supreme authority, that emanation of the divine power, has been preserved in my hands pure and immaculate. I now offer my tribute of gratitude to the eternal being, who has not suffered me to perish by the cruelty of a tyrant, by the secret dagger of conspiracy, or by the slow tortures of lingering disease. He has given me, in the midst of an honorable career, a splendid and glorious departure from this world, and I hold it equally absurd, equally base, to solicit or to decline the stroke of fate. He reproved the immoderate grief of the spectators and conjured them not to disgrace by unmanly tears the fate of a prince who in a few moments would be united with heaven and with the stars. The spectators were silent, and Julian entered into a metaphysical argument with the philosophers Priscus and Maximus on the nature of the soul. The efforts which he made of mind as well as body most probably hastened his death. His wound began to bleed with great violence. His respiration was embarrassed by the swelling of the veins— he called for a draught of cold water, and as soon as he had drank it, expired without pain, about the hour of midnight. Such, gentlemen, is the final exhibition of the religion of reason. In the insensibility of conscience, in the ignorance of the very idea of sin, in the contemplation of his own moral consistency, in the simple absence of fear, in the cloudless self-confidence, in the serene self-possession, in the cold self-satisfaction, we recognize the mere philosopher. Gibbon paints with pleasure what, conformably with the sentiments of a godless intellectualism, was an historical fulfillment of his own idea of moral perfection. Lord Shaftesbury had already drawn out that idea in a theoretical form in his celebrated collection of treatises which he has called Characteristics of Men, Manners, Opinions, Views, and it will be a further illustration of the subject before us, if you will allow me, gentlemen, to make some extracts from this work. One of his first attacks is directed against the doctrine of reward and punishment, as if it introduced a notion into religion inconsistent with the true apprehension of the beauty of virtue and with the liberality and nobleness of spirit in which it should be pursued. Men have not been content, he says, to show the natural advantages of honesty and virtue. They have rather lessened these, the better as they thought, to advance another foundation. They have made virtue so mercenary a thing, and have talked so much of its rewards, 
that one can hardly tell what there is in it after all which can be worth rewarding. For to be bribed only, or terrified into an honest practice, bespeaks little of real honesty or worth. If, he says elsewhere, insinuating what he dare not speak out, if through hope merely of reward or fear of punishment, the creature be inclined to do the good he hates or restrain from doing the ill to which he is not otherwise in the least degree averse, there is in this case no virtue or goodness whatever. There is no more of rectitude, piety, or sanctity in a creature thus reformed than there is meekness or gentleness in a tiger strongly chained or innocence and sobriety in a monkey under the discipline of the whip. While the will is neither gained nor the inclination wrought upon, but all alone prevails and forces obedience, the obedience is servile, and all which is done through it merely servile. That is, he says that Christianity is the enemy of moral virtue, as influencing the mind by fear of God, not by love of good. The motives, then, of hope and fear, being, to say the least, put far into the background, and nothing being morally good but what springs simply or mainly from a love of virtue for its own sake, this love-inspiring quality in virtue is its beauty, while a bad conscience is not much more than the sort of feeling which makes us shrink from an instrument out of tune. Some by mere nature, he says, others by art and practice, are masters of an ear in music, an eye in painting, a fancy in the ordinary things of ornament and grace, a judgment in proportions of all kinds, and a general good taste in most of those subjects which make the amusement and delight of the ingenious people of the world. Let such gentlemen as these be extravagant as they please, or as irregular in their morals, they must at the same time discover their inconsistency, live at variance with themselves, and in contradiction to that principle on which they ground their highest pleasure and entertainment. Of all other beauties which virtuosos pursue, poets celebrate, musicians sing, and architects or artists of whatever kind describe or form, the most delightful the most engaging and pathetic is that which is drawn from real life and from the passions. Nothing affects the heart like that which is purely from itself and of its own nature, such as the beauty of sentiments, the grace of actions, the turn of characters, and the proportions and features of a human mind. This lesson of philosophy, even a romance, a poem, or a play may teach us, let poets or the men of harmony deny, if they can, this force of nature, or withstand this moral magic. Everyone is a virtuoso of a higher or lower degree. Everyone pursues a grace of one kind or other. The venistum, the honestum, the decorum of things will force its way. The most natural beauty in the world is honesty and moral truth. For all beauty is truth. Accordingly, virtue being only one kind of beauty, the principle which determines what is virtuous is not conscience, but taste. Could we once convince ourselves, he says, of what is in itself so evident, namely, that in the very nature of things there must of necessity be the foundation of a right and wrong taste, as well in respect of inward character of features as of outward person, behavior, and action, we should be far more ashamed of ignorance and wrong judgment in the former than in the latter of these subjects. One who aspires to the character of a man of breeding and politeness is careful to form his judgment of arts and sciences upon right models of perfection, he takes particular care to turn his eye from everything which is gaudy, luscious, and of false taste. Nor is he less careful to turn his ear from every sort of music besides that which is of the best manner and truest harmony. It were to be wished we had the same regard to a right taste in life and manners. If civility and humanity be a taste, if brutality, insolence, riot be in the same manner a taste, who would not endeavor to force nature as well in this respect as in what relates to a taste or judgment in other arts and sciences? Sometimes he distinctly contrasts this taste with principle and conscience, and gives it the preference over them. After all, he says, 
tis not merely what we call principle, but a taste which governs men. They may think for certain this is right or that wrong. They may believe this is a virtue or that a sin. This is punishable by man or that by God. Yet if the savor of things lies cross to honesty, if the fancy be florid, and the appetite high towards the subaltern beauties and lower orders of worldly symmetries and proportions, the conduct will infallibly turn this latter way. Thus, somewhat like a Jansenist, he makes the superior pleasure infallibly conquer, and implies that, neglecting principle, we have but to train the taste to a kind of beauty higher than sensual. He adds, Even conscience, I fear, such as is owing to religious discipline, will make but a slight figure when this taste is set amiss. And hence the well-known doctrine of this author, that ridicule is the test of truth. For truth and virtue being beauty, and falsehood and vice deformity, and the feeling inspired by deformity being that of derision, as that inspired by beauty is admiration, it follows that vice is not a thing to weep about, but to laugh at. Nothing is ridiculous, he says, but what is deformed, nor is anything proof against raillery but what is handsome and just, and therefore it is the hardest thing in the world to deny fair honesty the use of this weapon, which can never bear an edge against herself and bears against everything contrary. And hence again, conscience, which intimates a lawgiver, being superseded by a moral taste or sentiment which has no sanction beyond the constitution of our nature, it follows that our great rule is to contemplate ourselves if we would gain a standard of life and morals. Thus he has entitled one of his treatises a soliloquy, with the motto, Nec te quesiveris extra, and he observes, The chief interest of ambition, avarice, corruption, and every sly insinuating vice is to prevent this interview and familiarity of discourse, which is consequent upon close retirement and inward recess. Tis the grand artifice of villainy and lewdness, as well as of superstition and bigotry, to put us upon terms of greater distance and formality with ourselves, and evade our proving method of soliloquy. A passionate lover, whatever solitude he may affect, can never be truly by himself. Tis the same reason which keeps the imaginary saint or mystic from being capable of this entertainment. Instead of looking narrowly into his own nature and mind, that he may be no longer a mystery to himself, he is taken up with the contemplation of other mysterious natures which he never can explain or comprehend. Taking these passages as specimens of what I call the religion of philosophy, it is obvious to observe that there is no doctrine contained in them which is not in a certain sense true. Yet on the other hand, that almost every statement is perverted and made false because it is not the whole truth. They are exhibitions of truth under one aspect, and therefore insufficient. Conscience is most certainly a moral sense, but it is more. Vice, again, is a deformity, but it is worse. Lord Shaftesbury may insist, if he will, that simple and solitary fear cannot effect a moral conversion, and we are not concerned to answer him. But he will have a difficulty in proving that any real conversion follows from a doctrine which makes virtue a mere point of good taste, and vice vulgar and ungentlemanlike. Such a doctrine is essentially superficial, and such will be its effects. It has no better measure of right and wrong than that of visible beauty and tangible fitness. Conscience indeed inflicts an acute pang, for that pang, forsooth, is irrational, and to reverence it is an illiberal superstition. But, if we will make light of what is deepest within us, nothing is left but to pay homage to what is more upon the surface. To seem becomes to be. What looks fair will be good. What causes offense will be evil. Virtue will be what pleases, vice what pains. As well may we measure virtue by utility as by such a rule. Nor is this an imaginary apprehension. 
we all must recollect the celebrated sentiment into which a great and wise man was betrayed in the glowing eloquence of his valediction to the spirit of chivalry. It is gone, cries Mr. Burke, that sensibility of principle, that chastity of honor which felt a stain like a wound, which inspired courage while it mitigated ferocity, which ennobled whatever it touched, and under which vice lost half its evil by losing all its grossness. In the last clause of this beautiful sentence, we have too apt an illustration of the ethical temperament of a civilized age. It is detection, not the sin, which is the crime. Private life is sacred, and inquiry into it is intolerable, and decency is virtue. Scandals, vulgarities, whatever shocks, whatever disgusts, are offenses of the first order. Drinking and swearing, squalid poverty, improvidence, laziness, slovenly disorder make up the idea of profligacy. Poets may say anything, however wicked, with impunity. Works of genius may be read without danger or shame, whatever their principles. Fashion, celebrity, the beautiful, the heroic, will suffice to force any evil upon the community. The splendors of a court and the charms of good society, wit, imagination, taste, and high breeding, the prestige of rank and the resources of wealth, are a screen, an instrument, and an apology for vice and irreligion. And thus at length we find, surprising as the change may be, that that very refinement of intellectualism, which began by repelling sensuality, ends by excusing it. Under the shadow indeed of the church, and in its due development, philosophy does service to the cause of morality. But when it is strong enough to have a will of its own, and is lifted up with an idea of its own importance, and attempts to form a theory, and to lay down a principle, and to carry out a system of ethics, and undertakes the moral education of the man, then it does but abet evils to which at first it seemed instinctively opposed. True religion is slow in growth, and when once planted, is difficult of dislodgement. But its intellectual counterfeit has no root in itself. It springs up suddenly, it suddenly withers. It appeals to what is in nature, and it falls under the dominion of the old Adam. Then, like dethroned princes, it keeps up a state and majesty when it has lost the real power. Deformity is its abhorrence. Accordingly, since it cannot dissuade men from vice, therefore in order to escape the sight of its deformity, it embellishes it. It skins and films the ulcerous place which it cannot probe or heal, whilst rank corruption mining all within infects unseen. And from this shallowness of philosophical religion, it comes to pass that its disciples seem able to fulfill certain precepts of Christianity more readily and exactly than Christians themselves. St. Paul, as I have said, gives us a pattern of evangelical perfection. He draws the Christian character in its most graceful form, in its most beautiful hues. He discourses of that charity which is patient and meek, humble and single-minded, disinterested, contented and persevering. He tells us to prefer each the other before himself, to give way to each other, to abstain from rude words and evil speech, to avoid self-conceit, to be calm and grave, to be cheerful and happy, to observe peace with all men, truth and justice, courtesy and gentleness, all that is modest, amiable, virtuous and of good repute. Such is St. Paul's exemplar of the Christian in his external relations. And, I repeat, the school of the world seems to send out living copies of this typical excellence with greater success than the church. At this day, the gentleman is the creation not of Christianity, but of civilization. But the reason is obvious. The world is content with setting right the surface of things. The church aims at regenerating the very depths of the heart. She ever begins with the beginning, and as regards the multitude of her children, is never able to get beyond the beginning, 
but is continually employed in laying the foundation. She is engaged with what is essential, as previous and as introductory to the ornamental and the attractive. She is curing men and keeping them clear of mortal sin. She is treating of justice and chastity and the judgment to come. She is insisting on faith and hope and devotion and honesty and the elements of charity and has so much to do with precept that she almost leaves it to inspirations from heaven to suggest what is of counsel and perfection. She aims at what is necessary rather than at what is desirable. She is for the many as well as for the few. She is putting souls in the way of salvation that they may then be in a condition, if they shall be called upon, to aspire to the heroic and to attain the full proportions as well as the rudiments of the beautiful. Such is the method, the policy, so to call it, of the church. But philosophy looks at the matter from a very different point of view. What have philosophers to do with the terror of judgment or the saving of the soul? Lord Shaftesbury calls the former a sort of panic fear. Of the latter, he scoffingly complains that the saving of souls is now the heroic passion of exalted spirits. Of course, he is at liberty on his principles to pick and choose out of Christianity what he will. He discards the theological, the mysterious, the spiritual. He makes selection of the morally or aesthetically beautiful. To him, it matters not at all that he begins his teaching where he should end it. It matters not that, instead of planting the tree, he merely crops its flowers for his banquet. He only aims at the present life. His philosophy dies with him. If his flowers do but last to the end of his revel, he has nothing more to seek. When night comes, the withered leaves may be mingled with his own ashes. He and they will have done their work. When night comes, the withered leaves may be mingled with his own ashes. He and they will have done their work. He and they will be no more. Certainly it costs little to make men virtuous on conditions such as these. It is like teaching them a language or an accomplishment, to write Latin or to play on an instrument. The profession of an artist, not the commission of an apostle. This embellishment of the exterior is almost the beginning and the end of philosophical morality. This is why it aims at being modest rather than humble. This is how it can be proud at the very time that it is unassuming. To humility, indeed, it does not even aspire. Humility is one of the most difficult of virtues both to attain and to ascertain. It lies close upon the heart itself and its tests are exceedingly delicate and subtle. Its counterfeits abound. However, we are little concerned with them here, for I repeat it is hardly professed even by name in the code of ethics which we are reviewing. As has been often observed, ancient civilization had not the idea and had no word to express it. Or rather, it had the idea and considered it a defect of mind, not a virtue, so that the word which denoted it conveyed a reproach. As to the modern world, you may gather its ignorance of it by its perversion of the somewhat parallel term condescension. Humility, or condescension, viewed as a virtue of conduct, may be said to consist, as in other things, so in our placing ourselves in our thoughts on a level with our inferiors. It is not only a voluntary relinquishment of the privileges of our own station, but an actual participation or assumption of the condition of those to whom we stoop. This is true humility, to feel and to behave as if we were low, not to cherish a notion of our importance while we affect a low position. Such was St. Paul's humility when he called himself the least of the saints, such the humility of those many holy men who have considered themselves the greatest of sinners. It is an abdication, as far as their own thoughts are concerned, of those prerogatives or privileges to which others deem them entitled. Now it is not a little instructive to contrast with this idea, gentlemen, with this theological meaning of the word condescension, its proper English sense. Put them in juxtaposition, and you will at once see the difference between the world's humility 
in the humility of the gospel. As the world uses the word, condescension is a stooping indeed of the person, but a bending forward, unattended with any the slightest effort to leave by a single inch the seat in which it is so firmly established. It is the act of a superior, who protests to himself while he commits it, that he is superior still, and that he is doing nothing else but an act of grace towards those on whose level in theory he is placing himself. And this is the nearest idea which the philosopher can form of the virtue of self-abasement. To do more than this is, to his mind, a meanness or an hypocrisy, and at once excites his suspicion and disgust. What the world is, such it has ever been. We know the contempt which the educated pagans had for the martyrs and confessors of the church, and it is shared by the anti-Catholic bodies of this day. Such are the ethics of philosophy when faithfully represented. But an age like this, not pagan, but professedly Christian, cannot venture to reprobate humility in set terms or to make a boast of pride. Accordingly, it looks out for some expedient by which it may blind itself to the real state of the case. Humility, with its grave and self-denying attributes, it cannot love. But what is more beautiful, what more winning, than modesty? What virtue, at first sight, simulates humility so well? But what, in fact, is more radically distinct from it? In truth, great as is its charm, modesty is not the deepest or the most religious of virtues. Rather, it is the advanced guard or sentinel of the soul militant, and watches continually over its nascent intercourse with the world about it. It goes the round of the senses, it mounts up into the countenance, it protects the eye and ear, it reins in the voice and gesture. Its province is the outward deportment, as other virtues have relation to matters theological, others to society, and others to the mind itself. And being more superficial than other virtues, it is more easily disjoined from their company. It admits of being associated with principles or qualities naturally foreign to it, and is often made the cloak of feelings or ends for which it was never given to us. So little is it the necessary index of humility that it is even compatible with pride. The better for the purpose of philosophy. Humble it cannot be, so forthwith modesty becomes its humility. Pride, under such training, instead of running to waste in the education of the mind, is turned to account. It gets a new name. It is called self-respect, and ceases to be the disagreeable, uncompanionable quality which it is in itself. Though it be the motive principle of the soul, it seldom comes to view. And when it shows itself, then delicacy and gentleness are its attire, and good sense and sense of honor direct its motions. It is no longer a restless agent without definite aim. It has a large field of exertion assigned to it, and it subserves those social interests which it would naturally trouble. It is directed into the channel of industry, frugality, honesty, and obedience, and it becomes the very staple of the religion and morality held in honor in a day like our own. It becomes the safeguard of chastity, the guarantee of veracity in high and low. It is the very household god of society as at present constituted, inspiring neatness and decency in the servant girl, propriety of carriage and refined manners in her mistress, uprightness, manliness, and generosity in the head of the family. It diffuses a light over town and country. It covers the soil with handsome edifices and smiling gardens. It tills the field, it stalks and embellishes the shop. It is the stimulating principle of providence on the one hand and of free expenditure on the other, of an honorable ambition and of elegant enjoyment. It breathes upon the face of the community, and the hollow sepulchre is forthwith beautiful to look upon. Refined by the civilization which has brought it into activity, this self-respect infuses into the mind an intense horror of exposure and a keen sensitiveness of notoriety and ridicule. 
It becomes the enemy of extravagances of any kind. It shrinks from what are called scenes. It has no mercy on the mock heroic, on pretense or egotism, on verbosity in language or what is called prosiness in conversation. It detests gross adulation, not that it tends at all to the eradication of the appetite to which the flatterer ministers, but it sees the absurdity of indulging it. It understands the annoyance thereby given to others, and if a tribute must be paid to the wealthy or the powerful, it demands greater subtlety and art in the preparation. Thus vanity is changed into a more dangerous self-conceit, as being checked in its natural eruption. It teaches men to suppress their feelings, and to control their tempers, and to mitigate both the severity and the tone of their judgments. As Lord Shaftesbury would desire, it prefers playful wit and satire in putting down what is objectionable as a more refined and good nature as well as a more effectual method than the expedient which is natural to uneducated minds. It is from this impatience of the tragic and the bombastic that it is now quietly but energetically opposing itself to the unchristian practice of dueling, which it brands as simply out of taste and as the remnant of a barbarous age. And certainly it seems likely to affect what religion has aimed at abolishing in vain. Hence it is that it is almost a definition of a gentleman to say he is one who never inflicts pain. This description is both refined and, as far as it goes, accurate. He is mainly occupied in merely removing the obstacles which hinder the free and unembarrassed action of those about him, and he concurs with their movements rather than takes the initiative himself. His benefits may be considered as parallel to what are called comforts or conveniences in arrangements of a personal nature, like an easy chair or a good fire, which do their part in dispelling cold and fatigue, though nature provides both means of rest and animal heat without them. The true gentleman, in like manner, carefully avoids whatever may cause a jar or a jolt in the minds of those with whom he is cast. All clashing of opinion, or collision of feeling, all restraint, or suspicion, or gloom, or resentment, his great concern being to make every one at their ease and at home. He has his eyes on all his company. He is tender towards the bashful, gentle towards the distant, and merciful towards the absurd. He can recollect to whom he is speaking. He guards against unseasonable allusions or topics which may irritate. He is seldom prominent in conversation and never wearisome, he makes light of favors while he does them, and seems to be receiving when he is conferring. He never speaks of himself except when compelled, never defends himself by a mere retort. He has no ears for slander or gossip, is scrupulous in imputing motives to those who interfere with him, and interprets everything for the best. He is never mean or little in his disputes, never takes unfair advantage, never mistakes personalities or sharp sayings for arguments, or insinuates evil which he dare not say out. From a long-sighted prudence, he observes the maxim of the ancient sage that we should ever conduct ourselves towards our enemy as if he were one day to be our friend. He has too much good sense to be affronted at insults, he is too well employed to remember injuries, and too indolent to bear malice. He is patient, forbearing, and resigned on philosophical principles. He submits to pain because it is inevitable, to bereavement because it is irreparable, and to death because it is his destiny. If he engages in controversy of any kind, his disciplined intellect preserves him from the blundering discourtesy of better, perhaps, but less educated minds, who, like blunt weapons, tear and hack instead of cutting clean, who mistake the point in argument, waste their strength on trifles, misconceive their adversary, and leave the question more involved than they find it. He may be right or wrong in his opinion, but he is too clear-headed to be unjust. He is as simple as he is forcible, and as brief as he is decisive. Nowhere shall we find greater candor, consideration, indulgence. He throws himself into the minds of his opponents. He accounts for their mistakes— he knows the weakness of human reason as well as its strength, its province, and its limits. If he be an unbeliever, he will be too profound and large-minded to ridicule religion or to act against it. 
He is too wise to be a dogmatist or fanatic in his infidelity. He respects piety and devotion. He even supports institutions as venerable, beautiful, or useful to which he does not assent. He honors the ministers of religion, and it contents him to decline its mysteries without assailing or denouncing them. He is a friend of religious toleration, and that not only because his philosophy has taught him to look on all forms of faith with an impartial eye, but also from the gentleness and effeminacy of feeling which is the attendant on civilization. Not that he may not hold a religion to in his own way, even when he is not a Christian. In that case, his religion is one of imagination and sentiment. It is the embodiment of those ideas of the sublime, majestic, and beautiful without which there can be no large philosophy. Sometimes he acknowledges the being of God. Sometimes he invests an unknown principle or quality with the attributes of perfection. And this deduction of his reason, or creation of his fancy, he makes the occasion of such excellent thoughts and the starting point of so varied and systematic a teaching that he even seems like a disciple of Christianity itself. From the very accuracy and steadiness of his logical powers, he is able to see what sentiments are consistent in those who hold any religious doctrine at all, and he appears to others to feel and to hold a whole circle of theological truths which exist in his mind no otherwise than as a number of deductions. Such are some of the lineaments of the ethical character which the cultivated intellect will form apart from religious principle. They are seen within the pale of the church and without it, in holy men and in profligate. They form the beau ideal of the world. They partly assist and partly distort the development of the Catholic. They may subserve the education of a St. Francis de Sales or a Cardinal Pole, they may be the limits of the contemplation of a Shaftesbury or a Gibbon. Basil and Julian were fellow students at the schools of Athens, and one became the saint and doctor of the church, the other her scoffing and relentless foe. This has been Knowledge Viewed in Relation to Religion, from the Idea of University by St. John Henry Newman, narrated by James T. Majewski, production copyright 2023 by Trinity Communications. This podcast is a production of catholicculture.org. Check out our other podcasts, including Way of the Fathers, an early church history podcast hosted by Jim Papandrea, Criteria, the Catholic film podcast, featuring deep analysis of great films from a Catholic perspective, and the Catholic Culture podcast, an interview show exploring Catholic arts, culture, and issues. You'll find all of this, as well as Catholic news, commentary, liturgical year resources, and more at catholicculture.org.